Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, okay. All right, thank you for the uh, the recommendation, Griconian. Guys, uh, yeah. you are going to help me understand why the Ottoman Empire was so weak when it came to the World War One and the Balkan War. And I was learning; I've been learning a bit more on uh, the World War One and how World War One started, which I've learned is way more fascinating than how World War Two started. Um, but I love history, still have a lot to learn, and uh, th this is just the Ottoman Empire and, and how it became so weak. Something, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it started with, with the Age of Exploration, because then it, it couldn't monopolize or, or demand, uh, you, you know, uh, upsell goods that were super valuable in East Asia, South Asia, to the Europeans. And so I'm sure when the Europeans were really good with their own over ocean trade routes lost a lot of power but still trying to learn here all right original link to the video top of the description my name's connor preemptive like overly sarcastic productions let's learn yes the ottoman empire a land learn. of proud history unique furniture and criminally right. underappreciated assassin's creed sequels between its rise in the 1300s and its dissolution after the first world war the ottomans have been around for a good long while and they spanned a lot of the mediterranean in the interim early modern europeans refer to them as the sick man of europe as a polite way of saying just die already but as we'll see that lasting portrayal of weakness and seemingly perpetual decline really misses the point so to find out what makes the Ottomans more than just a sick man, let's do some history. Early Ottoman history is notoriously murky because they didn't do a lot of writing until they stopped moving their capital every 30 years and properly settled down. But it all started with this one guy named Osman, who had a very apocryphal but nonetheless interesting dream of a tree growing out of him and covering the entire world in its shade, which is some pretty hardcore foreshadowing. Ollie. See, Osman was the leader of a small Anatolian tribe left in the messy post-Mongol power vacuum, and as far as his descendants are concerned, their empire started with him, which is why we call it Osmanlı or Ottoman. He and his son Orhan got to conquering and pushed northwest to Bursa and then across the Hellespont to Edirne, the latter of which remained the Ottoman capital for nearly a century. Now, when it came to holding onto their land, the aging Byzantine Empire had the grip strength of an arcade claw machine, and no one demonstrated that better than the fourth Ottoman Sultan. Yildirim so it seems like the Ottomans, like I learned in a previous video, at very a, a, a good amount of capable rulers, six like uh, in succession right off the bat, but uh, is it safe to say that the Byzantine Empire was like the the old man of of this part of of your of Europe, like the Ottomans were seen during World War One, or is that not a great comparison? the Thunder Machine, and no one demonstrated that better than the fourth Ottoman Sultan. Yildirim the Thunderbolt Bayezid earned his awesome nickname by doubling the empire in a decade. Yeah, this is names. your empire, Mehmed. and this is your empire on Yildirim Bayezid. Yeah. And speaking of Sultan Yildirim Bayezid, I should say that my pronunciations have been cleared by my very Turkish college roommate Emre, so I'm doing my best here. But anyway, as you can see, the early Ottoman Empire was perfectly bisected between Anatolia and Rumelia by a once mighty but now tiny and insignificant town called, um, Constantinople. Yeah, so after the combined forces of Europe sacked the city 200 years earlier while on their way to a crusade that they never even started, Constantinople was a shell of its former self. They tried to recruit allies to bail them out, but it didn't really work. Even an Ottoman force at the gates of Constantinople couldn't compel the Europeans to break their reputation for legendarily poor teamwork. Luckily for the Byzantines, this quasi-Mongol guy Tamerlane yoinked Anatolia and threw the Ottomans into a Tamerlane. brief kerfuffle of sultan- Tamerlane, Temujin, Genghis Khan, yeah, what the- I still- I still don't know the difference. So, Tamerlane- Tamerlane, is Temujin is Genghis Khan, but Tamerlane is a guy who came like a century after, right? I, I don't, 
Endless civil warring. Notably, the only big civil war Ottomans into for the Byzantines, this quasi Mongol guy Tamerlane yoinked Anatolia and threw the Ottomans into a brief kerfuffle of sultanless civil warring. Yoinked. Notably, the only big civil war in their whole 600 year long history, which shocks me. And if you think that's absurd, get a load of why it's the only one. So you see, the official practice for avoiding succession crises like this in the future was, um, state sanctioned fratricide? Which sounds really stupid because like a royal it, brawl? It, it is, but it worked though. <laughs> so I have no choice but to file this under history's greatest ideas that were just dumb enough to work. So with that sorted out and the empire reconstituted, the Ottomans directed their attention back to Constantinople, the so-called Red Apple of Christendom. Besides being the one strategically non-Ottoman speck on the map, the conquest of the city carried huge secular and religious prestige. It also provided a strategic center between their split holdings in Anatolia and Rumelia, and it had a built-in source of income from Black Sea trade. Sultan Mehmet II really wanted Constantinople to surrender, but they name. didn't, so he sacked it with insane siege weaponry and a 10 to 1 army size advantage. First time I saw one of these things, uh, these siege towers, was in Lord of the Rings Return of the King when I was a kid. And I was so happy the first time I, I learned that they were actually real siege weapons or siege structures. Uh, yeah. Mehmet made it, so he sacked it with insane siege weaponry and a 10 to 1 army size advantage. Mehmet made conquering the most historically impregnable city in Europe look easy. As congratulations, Venice and added the Ottomans to the official Constantinople Conquerors Club, where they mostly just shared history memes back and forth. Thankfully, although lots of the city was destroyed, the famous Byzantine church of Hagia Sophia survived, and the Sultan was so awestruck by it that he ordered its conversion to a mosque to preserve it. As a result, Hagia Sophia, as it's known in Turkish, is still standing today. The I love that, that at least it's, it's preserved, you know. It, it, um, but it does make me sad because it makes me think of all the stuff that wasn't and probably would have been really beautiful and awe-inspiring if, if it was not left to decay or, or destroyed. Ottomans may have been conquerors, but they were keenly aware of the historical Ask legacies Rastel. they were inheriting along with the city of Constantinia. And speaking of Istanbul, let's clear up those names. Constantinopoli, before and after the conquest, was known to the Ottomans as Constantinia, which likewise means City of Constantine in Arabic, and its state is that for most of the empire. Unofficially, people called it the city, and Greek phrases about being in or going to the city, translated as Stinboli, turned into what we now know as Istanbul. Istanbul. For convenience, I'll be referring to it as Istanbul from here on out, even though that wasn't really its official name until the 1920s. With Istanbul Incorporated, Mehmet the Conqueror lived up to his- Okay, so the Ottomans didn't call them that. Because why would an Islamic empire change their name of their main city from a Greek translation? Uh, okay. His okay. name, official name until the 1920s. It, right. With Istanbul Incorporated, Mehmet the Conqueror lived up to his name by pushing out in all directions, even getting the Ottomans a foothold on Crimea in addition to the Aegean and Anatolian holdings. They quickly figured out that the Europeans weren't really as tied to their religious fervor as they claimed and were much more interested in fighting each other. So the Ottomans played enemies against each other Classic. and conquered piecewise, unmet by any wall of pan-European defense. And they got themselves a really nice domain out of it. Between their natural resources and control over key trading routes, they had a doubly advantageous position for most of their history. At this point, their biggest rival was the Republic of Venice, who held strategic trading posts across the Mediterranean, like Cyprus and Crete, in part thanks to their massive navy. But at the same time, Venice was also the Ottomans' closest trading partners, so when they weren't squabbling over islands, they were making each other fabulously rich. It was a fruitful, if tense, relationship, and it happened in large part because of the Ottoman geography and both parties' willingness to cooperate across religious lines. It's largely due to this partnership that we ever got the Renaissance, as trade brought back classical Greek and Roman works preserved by Muslim scholars, in addition to the piles of cash that funded new artworks in Italy. Mehmet II loved his classics and thought of himself as a New Age Alexander, but truth be told, he wasn't all that far off in terms of lasting historical significance. And I'm talking a lot about the Sultans here because the Ottoman government was pretty dependent on their head honcho being, you know, an empire. Aside from local government. Guys, I asked this in the Roma in a Romania video that that I, I I need to check to see if it was answered. But how do, how is Romanian 
a romance language. Is it, and and is it because of of the Venetian influence or or is this the Danube, the mouth of the is it the Danube, whatever this major European river is that flows into the Black Sea? Obviously, going to be super important. I don't know if the Latin language was was carried down through the river or if Venetian trading made an influence on the language and but how is it how is how are there so many present day slavic speaking nations slavic languages in between romania and the other romance languages you know italian portuguese spanish french I gotta see historical if historical significance if Alexander, was but truth be told, he wasn't all that far off in terms of lasting historical significance. And I'm talking a lot about the sultans here because the Ottoman government was pretty dependent on their head honcho being, you know, an empire. Aside from local governments, most administration relied solidly on the sultan and his small army of viziers and bureaucrats. Speaking of armies, he also had a notoriously badass personal guard called the Janissaries, who were supposed to serve the sultan at all times, but in the long run janissaries that sounds very familiar they're bodyguards uh stay hydrated guys janissaries who were supposed to serve the sultan at all times but in the long run they had a suspicious amount of input into who did and did not become the next sultan that was a problem the ottomans never quite solved Sultan Bayezid II didn't do much in comparison to his old man Mehmet, but then Selim I shows up and boom, he conquers Egypt and Syria in no time flat. You can imagine the collective <laughs> Ooh, that the Europeans <laughs> were making in the news of that one. And this was a big deal because with the Egyptian Mamluk Sultanate defeated and the entire Eastern Mediterranean under their belt, no one could go east or west without crossing the Ottomans. But there Age was another option, south. And this is where their actual biggest trading rival shows up. Portugal. Situated on the opposite end of the Mediterranean, the Portuguese figured out how to get access to the Indian Ocean by sailing around Africa. Since the Ottomans had control of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, they had a similarly advantageous route to key markets. They tried digging a Suez Canal in the later 1500s, but they didn't have the right technology for it, so oh well. Also, the back and forth between the Ottomans- So was it actually a mistake in hindsight to conquer Syria and Egypt? Like, in, in hindsight? Because it it's not that they could have produced, obviously not in hindsight, great idea, awesome, but not knowing that, like, could would they have been better off if they just did Ottomans in Venice was still going on, but it settled down when the Sultans found much, much bigger fish to fry. The Ottomans also had beef with the Safavid Persians to the east, but that's not the biggest deal in the long run. And speaking of enemies who didn't put up much of a fight, the Pope called for a crusade when the Ottomans took the Holy Land, but come on, this is medieval Europe, of course nothing happened. But then Selim dies, and it's Suleiman time, baby! So, uh, Onion let me hat. take a minute to explain my excited, excitedness at this because this is honestly pretty exciting. Suleiman the Magnificent, aka the Lawgiver, reigned from 1520 to 1566, and he is the coolest sultan. Call me basic all you want, but I know what I'm about. In addition to codifying secular and religious law to make the justice system fairer and more efficient, he went on 13 campaigns in pretty much every direction. Europe was convinced that Suleiman was using cheat codes because the game looked like it was way too easy for him to win. He also sorted out some trade deals with the Portuguese, which before then had been rather messier and involved a lot more cannons. So he fixed the laws, expanded the empire, solidified a gigantic Sorry. win. He also sorted out some trade deals with the Portuguese, which before then had been rather messier and involved a lot more cannons. So he fixed the laws, expanded the empire, solidified a gigantic source of revenue from Indian Ocean trade, and things were looking pretty dang good. For most, the reign of Suleiman was without a doubt the golden age of the Ottoman Empire, and it's because of this ridiculous trade money that he was able to go all out on building projects and art. In addition to the strong colors and bold designs of silks, manuscript painting- Oh, cool, question, cool, cool, question, quick, quick, question. Could you- I'm assuming you can't because people would have tried, but there's no way to sort of- I don't know which one is the Tigris and which one is the Euphrates. Uh, I forget. But, like, you couldn't connect the more southerly one to the Mediterranean. Obviously, you couldn't. Someone would have thought about that. But that would be pretty convenient to get to the... Is this not... Is this the Persian Gulf? What was it? Things were looking pretty dang good. 
did. For most, the reign of Suleiman was without a doubt the golden age of the Ottoman Empire, and it's because of this ridiculous trade money that he was able to go all out on building projects and art. In addition to the strong colors and bold designs of silks, manuscript paintings, and unreasonably gorgeous calligraphy, Suleiman commissioned hundreds of mosques and other buildings across the empire. The most famous examples are from the architect Mimar Sinan, whose work set the tone for centuries of Ottoman architecture. That man really knew his geometry, but let's get back to the matter at hand. It's after Suleiman's death that the general perception of the Ottomans starts to shift towards that sick man idea. And I hope I can explain in the rest of this video why the truth is more nuanced than that. The big obvious moment that people point to of, oh, hey, look, now they're really in decline, is the Battle of Lepanto, where the combined forces of Venice, Spain, Genoa, and the Pope banded together in literally the only instance of substantive European cooperation in the entire Renaissance. But they succeeded in stopping the Ottomans from pushing any further westward. The battle was a loss for the Ottoman navy, but since the European alliance promptly fell apart the second the battle ended, there was no follow-up, and the Ottomans happily kept everything that they had already. Honestly, not a terrible outcome. Although this famous battle signifies a broad end to Ottoman conquest, I think it's short-sighted to So can it be said that the reason that the Ottoman Empire became the sick man of Europe is because of a lot of European infighting? That they were either already busy after defeating that, that one war against the Ottomans where they bent it together, that they went back to infighting or that they would rather have a weak Ottoman Empire than... So why didn't anyone try any individual one of them, even if not together anymore, try to, like, take some of these places? Is it because others... So were they just too preoccupied fighting each other? Too... Okay. It's happily kept everything that they had already. Honestly, not a terrible outcome. Although this he kept everything that they had already. Honestly, not a terrible outcome. Although this famous battle signifies a broad end to Ottoman conquest, I think it's short-sighted to say that it signaled the empire's decline. After Lepanto, they still had their trade networks, they still had their government, they were still producing beautiful art, and they happily held on to lots of their territory without any threat of civil war. They had some rebellions, some client kingdoms came in and went here and there, and there was some business with Vienna that didn't go anywhere, but aside from a few fuzzy frontiers, the Mediterranean core of the empire was very stable for another two and a half centuries after the Golden Age. Modern scholars have started filing this period under stagnation, but I feel like even that has a negative connotation. I personally prefer to describe the Ottoman Empire as chilling in the 15th, 16th, and 1700s, and I honestly don't think there's anything wrong with that. I kind of feel like I'm on a body image campaign, like stop stigmatizing empires, they come in all shapes and sizes, but they do! And this is a really good example of that! <sighs> Anyway, I'll share a couple fun stories from this period, and then I'll hop forward to wrap this all up. So in the early 1600s, Sultan Ahmed raided the state treasury to build a new imperial mosque, nicknamed the Blue Mosque. Anyway, I'll share a couple fun stories from this period, and then I'll hop forward to wrap this all up. So in the early 1600s, Sultan Ahmed raided the state treasury to build a new imperial mosque, nicknamed the Blue Mosque for the abundance of rare Persian aquamarine stone decorating the interior. Legend goes that after the mosque was built, some French traders were very impressed, and when they went home, they told all of their friends about the beautiful turquoise, i.e. Turkish, stone. So with time, the word turquoise, or turquoise, turquoise. simply referred ah. to that bright blue color found inside Ahmed's mosque. And I generally think it's a gorgeous building. When I saw it in person, it absolutely blew me away. And on the other side, the reason I'm 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 waiting to hear then what he does consider the beginning of the end, because he just argued, armchair historian, that that wasn't the beginning of the end. That they were still chilling and they didn't have any uprisings in their territory. But I, I'm I'm sort of just waiting. Side of building. When I saw it in person, it absolutely blew me away. And on the other side of that, you have Sultan Murat IV, who banned alcohol and coffee, and then would go bar hopping at night in disguise in search of lawbreakers. If he found one, he would surprisingly reveal his true identity and then gleefully behead them. So you Jeez. win some, you lose some. Also, uh, some pirates of his captured Iceland for a hot minute, which is like 17 different layers of confusing. But again, I'm jumping ahead because the 1700s are mostly no, just no, Russia. No, 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 don't jump ahead. How? 
confusing but again for a hot minute which is like 17 different layers of confusing did they go up the volga or the the the, the Dnieper? um and then how did they why what but again, I'm jumping ahead because the 1700s are mostly just Russia and Austria flexing their muscles and pushing down on the northern Ottoman border, and Persia still poking around the eastern front every once in a while, but internally things were still doing well overall. The problem was that a general apathy towards reform kept the Ottomans half a century behind the rest of Europe in terms of technology, scholarship, and military training. So it's the 1800s where their problems come to a head all at once, and stuff actually starts going tangibly downhill for the Ottomans. Yeah, you remember how early Earlier Anything I was saying that it would have been really Napoleonic? easy to stand up to the Ottomans if Europe properly teamed up. Yeah, so this is exactly when that happens, and unsurprisingly, Crimean it worked War? really well. The big threats this time around came from the West, as the Napoleonic Wars were spilling out all across Europe. France rolled through Egypt and Britain followed shortly behind, with the result being that Egypt became semi-independent, turning into a vassal state rather than a fully-fledged Ottoman territory. After that, France, Russia, and England helped Greek revolutionaries gain independence, and then France yoinked Algeria in the confusion. Then, in 1878, another war with Russia saw 50% of the Balkans go poof, England officially swiped Egypt for themselves in 1882, and Italy colonized Libya in the- hmm. so you didn't bring up the Crimean War. Th that didn't do anything? in the confusion. Then, in 1878, missionaries gain independence, and then France yoinked Algeria in the confusion. Then, in 1878, another war with Russia saw 50% of the Balkans go poof, England officially swiped Egypt for themselves in 1882, and Italy colonized Libya in 1912, the same year that Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece swept up the rest of the Balkans. At this point, it's really just a big European game of, hey, let's partition the Ottomans, woo! And, as you can see, it's really after 1870 that the proverbial sick man started dramatically coughing into that handkerchief. On the one hand, it wasn't all terrible, as there were a handful of economic, military, legal, social, and technological reforms that helped modernize the empire through the 1800s. As a side note, this period saw the refinement of a centuries-old technique of water painting called ebru. In what's really reverse watercolor, artists transferred dyes into a pool using special tools to create shapes out of spots, and old Hold on ultimately transfer the image onto a piece of paper. The effect it produces gives it the nickname paper marbling, Hold on, no. Oh my god, I'm not gonna forget this. Oh my god. No, no, no. The forms that helped modernize the empire through the- Oh yes. Thank god. This is why I say it, but, but okay. So, is- could this be more evidence that having no war while have, being relatively peaceful while everyone around you is fighting with each other is not a good thing for you because they're essentially gaining war experience, ga gaining war technology, tactics. And, and so it's like being peaceful means you become weaker. Is that fair to say? It, it, it's almost like, you know, you know, they were, they were relatively peaceful for this long. Well, maybe that was the start of the downfall when they didn't have to fight so much. Is that, uh, do you get what I'm saying here? I'm, I'm, the moral of the story I'm trying to give is not keep wars, they help us technologically, but they sort of do. And maybe the Ottomans should have been doing some more conquering or something to gain that military technology and tactics and not yeah, it just seems like at the end of the 1800s, they're just, they stand absolutely no shot. The 1800s. As a side of all of these other ones who have been like, they've been practicing all off season or I, I, I'm ruining my analogy. Do, do you understand what I mean? It, it kind of seems like being peaceful for too long while others are fighting is a bad thing for you in the future when they turn to you. I'd note, this yeah. period saw the refinement of a centuries-old technique of water painting called ebru. In what's really reverse watercolor, artists transferred dyes into a pool using special tools to create shapes out of spots, and ultimately transfer the image onto a piece of paper. The effect it produces gives it the nickname paper marbling, and it is gorgeous. The best part is, ebru is still widely practiced today. But returning to my earlier oh, point, pretty smush? pictures usually can't save an empire, and the fact that them sort of keeping pace is news proves the point a little bit. 
let's let's wrap this up. After the Ottomans allied with Germany and the Central Powers in the First World War and promptly lost, the post-war Sykes-Picot agreement between Britain and France carved up the Levantine and Arabian territories, confining the Ottomans to Anatolia under strict supervision of the Allies. The Turks proceeded to fight back against the Allied powers in the Turkish War of Independence, which ended with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the Republican People's Party officially canning the Ottomans supervision of the Allies. The Turks proceeded to fight back against the Allied powers in the Turkish War of Independence, which ended with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the Republican People's Party officially canning the Ottoman Empire and founding the modern Republic of Turkey. I'm having fun with the Turkish words, sue me. And that's the Ottoman Empire. Turkey. It had a really long run, and I would say a pretty solid one at that. While it's a fascinating story in general, it's useful because it addresses how we see decline. The Ottomans had a rise, a peak which turned into a long plateau, and then a sharp fall at the very end. It's crucial to our understanding of history that we recognize the possibility of unconventional historical trajectories. Like, for instance, how there can be a middle ground between Golden Age and horrible collapse. The Ottomans are a great example of how an empire with good geography and solid economics can spend over two centuries doing the impossible, sitting back and chilling out. And that, I think, was their demise. Anyways, fantastic video. Uh, thank you, Griconian from Discord, for the recommendation. Um, for, especially for a 15-minute video. Obviously, um, Overly Sarcastic Productions is a fantastic channel with great videos. But it seems to me like this part where or just the part where uh they uh conquered Syria and Egypt forced Portugal for one and then others to seek different trade routes and therefore you had less economic control over the cash you were making from those goods coming over land and 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 whatnot and two is is where, where was it where where was it where where was the battle where where was it Right here. And two. Decline is the Battle of Lepanto, where the combined two of, oh, hey, the truth is more nuanced than that. The big obvious moment that people point to of, oh, hey, look, now they're really in decline is the Battle of Lepanto, where the combined forces of Venice. I don't think that they were in decline because they lost. I, I, I want to say that this is when they declined from what I've learned so far but not because of the military defeat. I think it's because it was at this point where they stopped fighting and you had look now other countries, other nations, states, entities fighting each other. And when, when, it, when he's saying that they're just chilling, that's exactly, I think, what the problem was. Because you chilled so long, when, it, when the time came to where... Uh, you know, France and and England were and the UK wanted parts of Northern Africa and Italy wanted to, and then the Balkan. It's just like you, that's. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I understand why he doesn't think that they call him blue, right? And our overly cross. I understand why he doesn't think this is the 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 beginning of the end but i think it is for the reason he doesn't think it is no 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 not for the reason that he doesn't think it's because of the peace it's like fighting futuristic people that are like no not fu i'm going too far that's what i i think i've gained mostly here of course the overseas trade not needing the ottoman empire so much for goods uh, from the east and com um, chilling, as he said, chilling, not fighting. You weren't fighting. The fact that you didn't have rebellions, you didn't ha weren't c consistently fighting like the big guys, like like I don't know the Persians or people in Europe. To to it would have been better to lose some land, gain some land ten years later, or lose some land. I think that would be more healthy than just having peace. And it, it seems kind of antithetical or paradoxical, but I think you get what I mean. I think that they didn't get enough war practice and military technology advancements, tactics, etc., to stave off the eventual powers that did have that stuff from gobbling them up. So, 
Great video. Love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. Would appreciate any comments down below. If I said something wrong, very big possibility. I welcome anything, disagreements, any comments. Love if you like and subscribe so we can learn uh, next time. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next video. Bye, guys.